So I'm Dr. Joanne Miller. I'm the site coordinator for the UVic site. And to begin, I'd like to acknowledge with respect the Lewungo speaking peoples on whose traditional territory this university stands and the Songhees, Esquimo, and Wasainuk people whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to attend tonight's event, including our panelists, to all of our participants including those who are watching this via live streaming and to those that are here in person. A very big thank you to each and every one of you. Some of you are participating in the tracking cohort. Those are the folks on the live stream. Everybody here, I believe, is in the comprehensive uh, cohort. Regardless of how you're participating in the CLSA, your commitment to the study is greatly appreciated and is absolutely crucial for our understanding of aging. All of you have participated in two rounds of data collection. Some of you have recently completed or are in the process of completing the third round. Thank you very, very much for participating and volunteering your time. Tonight's event has been developed as a direct result of comments you have made and questions you have raised over the past couple of years. And if my staff are in here, I don't know whether they are. Are any of the CLSA staff, site staff here? It's very borderline you. Okay, is that better? Yes. Okay, I'll try. Okay, are any of the CLSA staff in here? Okay, they, they're the folks that were at the reception tables helping you out with the, the refreshments, etc. These individuals, individually and collectively, are what make the UVic a CLS site work effectively. How about the uh, Institute of Aging and Lifelong Health folks? Are they in the, in the auditorium? I know Lois is. They're some of our support staff. This, this study falls under the Institute of Aging and Lifelong Health. The staff over there pass on your messages to us. We're located down at the Gorge Road Hospital. They're the ones that pass on the messages to us, letting us know about the missed appointments or uh, that we've forgotten something or pa pass on your uh, uh, updated contact information. Make sure that there's a room available at our hut if that's where you choose to have your interview. And their support is absolutely essential for the study as well. And finally, but most importantly, from, uh, in terms of information providing, I'd like to thank all of our panel members for taking the time out of their busy schedule for, and being here tonight. I'd like to now ask Dr. Scott Hoffer, the director of the Institute on Aging and Lifelong Health at uh, UVic, and the primary investigator for the CLSA uh, site to say a few words. They're gonna, they're, I think they're gonna move off. Yeah, very good. C can you all hear me okay? No? <laughs> Let me see what I can do here. Can, <laughs> can you hear me better now? All right. All right. I'm, I'm delighted you're all here tonight. Um, I'm the director of the Institute on Aging and Lifelong Health and the site, uh, the Victoria site principal investigator of the CLSA. The Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging is Canada's largest and most comprehensive study on the health and well-being of the country's aging population. Uh, the CLSA study itself is one of the largest studies of its kind in the world. Uh, it permits a rigorous examination of genetic, biological, medical, psychological, lifestyle, social and economic factors and how these impact changes in both physical functioning and mental functioning in the midlife to later life. I'd like to acknowledge the contributions that each of you make as CLSA participants to this cutting edge Canadian research study on lifelong health and aging. You are the most important part of this study. Uh, this is a very large community effort all across Canada. Many, uh, 10 different research sites, participants all over Canada. Uh, and I'm delighted to have a role in this truly remarkable study. And so I welcome and I look forward to tonight. Thank you. Okay, I'm now going to introduce our panelists for tonight. 
Dr. Denise Cloutier is a professor in the UVic Department of Geography and a research fellow affiliate with the Institute on Aging and Lifelong Health. As a health and social geographer, Denise's primary interest is in geographies of aging, where she studies the continuum of care and integrated models of health service delivery for older adults. Her research and teaching focus on a wide array of methodologies, quantitative, qualitative, indigenous, and mixed methods approaches. And Denise is on, thank you, Denise. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to figure out my left and my right. <laughs> Dr. Scott Hoffer, you have already met. He's the director of the UVic Institute on Aging and Lifelong Health, and a professor and Harold Moore, MD, and Willima Moore, MD, research chair in adult development and aging in the Department of Psychology. Scott is an expert in longitudinal research, focusing on aging-related changes in cognitive and physical capabilities, the identification of lifespan factors and health-related causes underlying change in functioning, as well as the evaluation of differences across birth cohorts and countries. And as we've mentioned, Scott is the Victoria site lead for the CLSA. Besides Scott is Dr. Marilyn Bader, originally from Alberta, Dr. Bader moved to Victoria in July 1992 after completion of her medical training and specialization in geriatric medicine. She has worked as a consultant geriatrician in Victoria for 26 years, working in acute care and outpatient settings. For six years, Marilyn was the medical director for Seniors Health and has now returned to full-time clinical practice. And finally, Dr. Deborah Sheets, at the very end, is an associate professor in the UVic School of Nursing. Her research interests focus on gerontology and in particular dementia, caregiving and technology in healthcare. Deborah is a co-lead researcher on the Voices in Motion project, an intergenerational choir for community dwelling people living with memory loss and their family caregivers. The study is reducing the stigma of dementia and increasing social connections. She is also PI of an Amazon Echo technology project to improve the quality of life of people with memory loss and to support caregivers. She was one of the previous site co-leads for the CLSA here in Vic at UVic. Okay, thank you. So, Denise. Mm -hmm. Just right here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanne. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Thank you. Um, it's my tremendous pleasure to be here tonight with you. And in my time, I was going to talk about the, thank you very much, the um, Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging and the Determinants of Health. And I want to start uh, initially, I guess, by uh, making a disclosure or a confession that I have been involved with the CLSA from the very beginning in developing many of the questions that you answer in terms of the social working group, but I have not used the data my, myself yet, and I'm so anxious and so appreciative to get a chance to use the data that you are all providing. <coughs> Excuse me. So, <coughs> oh no, not a good start. <laughs> so in, in my, um, well, what I wanted to begin with is to uh, think about why the CLSA survey instruments ask individuals all these questions about their age, gender, marital status, income sources, health, housing, behaviors related to smoking, alcohol use, exercise and nutrition, driving and mobility, to name a few, and how these questions relate to and help us think about the research and the factors and conditions that are important in considering what determines our health. The CLSA and the opportunities it provides help us to understand the range of factors and conditions, opportunities and constraints that determine our health. And we are able to use this information to help to make improvements in our health and our quality of life, our health care services and our communities. With this CLSA opportunity, we have the opportunity, we have the possibility of following, following older adults for 20 years to try to make improvements and to understand what it is that keeps some individuals healthy and what it is that makes other persons more vulnerable in terms of their health and well-being. We know quite a lot about many of the things that influence our health and wellness, like the value of quitting smoking and exercising and eating well, reducing our alcohol consumption, rats, and keeping 
physically and mentally active. But there are many other areas to explore, especially with respect to rare outcomes and to all of the interrelationships that exist between these factors. And finally, on this first slide, I have a picture of the coat of many colors. And it is on there quite deliberately to illustrate that as aging individuals, aging persons, we have common characteristics and common health outcomes, but we are also tremendously diverse as individuals. And even though we are doing this very large population-based survey, no single other person will have all of the experiences that we have in our, in our lives. So I, I wanted to begin as a geographer with a little bit of information about population aging trends in Canada and in BC. So we know that demographic aging is an important factor shaping society nowadays. And many of you will know that as of the 2016 census, for the first time in history, there are more individuals that are 65 years of age and older in our population than there are individuals under the age of 14. And this is a very important factor. Like many other developed nations around the globe, with this demographic aging, Canada must plan and prepare for this growth in older adult populations with all that that implies. In, the, in Canada today, about 17% of the population are 65 years of age and over. In British Columbia, we have one of the fastest growing older adult populations in the Canadian context, but we are a little bit behind the Atlantic provinces who are growing more rapidly in terms of older adults than we are. The highest proportion of older adults live on the island, 23%, and the interior of British Columbia, where there's also about 23% of the population are 65 years of age and over. In Victoria, it's about 21%. And an interesting factoid for comparison is that in BC, and many of you will know this as well, we have many of the oldest communities in Canada in terms of population aging such as Sydney, White Rock, Penticton, Qualicum, and Parksville. And Qualicum Beach has 50% of its population who are age 65 and over. So we see that demographic aging is an important trend that has significant influences in shaping our society. And this is something that the CLSA and the work that you do in giving your information to us helps us to understand, to plan for the growth in older adult populations. So uh, when we talk about health, maybe let's just begin and, and uh, think about a holistic concept that considers our physical, mental, social, emotional, and spiritual wellness and well-being. This is kind of the context in which the CLSA has developed to think about health. And this particular model of the determinants of health by Dahlgren and Whitehead has been around since the 1990s. But it helps us to understand that individuals have characteristics such as age and our gender identity and our genetics, and we live within contexts that uh, consider our networks of families and neighborhoods and communities and all of the things that that entails. And all of these things have different influences on our health and wellness. And so that is one of the reasons that you see the uh, CLSA survey asking you questions about the nature of your family dynamics, again, that those age and gender, housing, um, the nature of your community, food security questions, questions about unemployment, water and sanitation, access to health care services, and your housing. These are all kind of this constellation of influences at our individual level, where we live on a day-to-day -day basis, and within our communities. And thinking about how all of that influences our health and well-being is important within the context of the CLSA. If we think about what are the core determinants of our health, researchers for some time have been playing around with these percentages. But what we know is that about 10% of our health is influenced by our genetics, human biology, our age and gender. 50 to 60% 
is influenced by our socioeconomic status. This refers to our education, our income, and our occupational categories. And our lifestyle behaviors are considered within that as well. Smoking, drinking, exercise, nutrition, the nature of our relationships with family and friends, the nature of our housing in terms of whether we own or rent, whether we live in apartments or duplexes or co-housing units, and our sense of belonging to those communities and our life satisfaction. All of these things are uh, implicated in our health as well. And you can see that that 50 to 60% of an influence on our health comes from what we call the social determinants of health. About 10 to 20% of our health is believed to be influenced by the environment, our air quality, water quality, the peacefulness of our society, whether we're engaged in constant wars or, or battles or um, different political debates. And 10 to 25% of our health is influenced by our health care. That is access to available, comprehensive services that are of high quality. So this is how we think about the core determinants of our health. And again, you will see how uh, some of the questions that you've been filling in, all of the questions and information you've been providing, taps in or ties in at some level to this understanding of what influences or determines our health. Um, in the early 2000s, uh, researchers and policymakers in a Canadian context came up with about 12 to 14 social determinants of health. And study after study have pointed to the importance of these social factors as being critical and meaningful in determining and shaping our health and wellness in a Canadian context. We know that these factors listed up there at the top have a tremendous influence on mortality trends, morbidity, that is our illness and disease patterns, and our health and well-being. There has been a lot of research done that tells us our health and wellness is strongly correlated with these determinants. And again, this is why the CLSA asks you a range of questions on these types of subjects. Probably one of the most important determinants of our health is the social gradient and largely related to our income status as well though related and influenced by uh, education and occupation. But we've known since the mid 1980s that where we are in society on that income or social gradient has a tremendous bearing on our health and wellness over time. So this is why within the CLSA there are a lot of questions about income and income is uh, is tried to, well, within the questionnaires and the surveys, we try to get at income in a number of different ways. What are the range of sources that you rely upon? What is your average or annual household income? All of these things are uh, important ways of, of looking at income because we know how important it is and how influential it is in shaping our health and wellness. And we know that people who are in lower income categories who face poverty, who face food insecurity at different times, are more likely to have challenges with their health and well-being. We will see them being more vulnerable in some ways. And this is something that we are interested, of course, in understanding in a Canadian context and reducing the negative consequences uh, of some of these determinants so that we can promote the health and well-being of populations. Uh, in terms of lifestyle determinants of health, these are some things that we may be able to modify to promote better health for ourselves. Maybe because not all of us can, but their lifestyle or their behavioral, behavioral determinants. Physical activity levels, mental activity, nutrition, smoking and drinking behaviors, etc. There are a lot of questions in the CLSA on these areas again because they help us to understand the kind of positive or negative health behaviors that people are engaging in and tell us a lot about how those are associated or related to particular kinds of health outcomes. And by looking at these trends and patterns that will emerge, 
doctors, dentists, public health officials, and planners, policymakers as well, have more evidence and information to help individuals in regards to health and wellness and preventing illness and disease throughout the lifespan. So finally, in my last slide, I wanted to emphasize something that I said at the beginning again. For the first time, and Scott mentioned this as well, with the CLSA, with these 20 years of data, we will be able to understand how some of these patterns in terms of mental health, physical health, education, the influence of moves and migration on health outcomes, changes in occupational status and marital status, how when we can look at how things change for individuals over time, we have even more information at our disposal to understand what needs to be done in terms of health service development, public health interventions, personal lifestyle interventions. And for the first time, we have this exciting possibility in a Canadian context to do this type of research. So I hope that I have given you a little bit of a flavor for why the CLSA asks some of the many questions that it does and why scientists are interested in this information now and over time. And finally, I hope that my comments have served to illustrate how important your participation in this research is for yourselves, hopefully first and foremost, but also for all older Canadians today and into the future. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to say a few words about what I understand is everyone's favorite module, the cognition one. Uh, I want you to know first, though, that your, cog your cognitive performance, your scores on these tests, they will vary w even within day. Uh, the, whether you've, you have work stress or relationship stress, how well you slept last night, whether you're fatigued, uh, all of these impact your performance within day. And we know this from different kinds of studies that we do. But there are also a number of factors across the lifespan that impact the growth of your cognitive ability, as well as maybe be begins to, to slow some of these, these types of, of activities. Um, we know that some types of cognitive ability uh, remain stable and increase with age. And some types of cognitive ability, like speed of processing, your reaction time, that probably peaks in your mid to early 20s, where we begin to see some, some gradual changes across midlife and into later life. So this happens to us all. This is, this is typical. But, it, but we also show a lot of individual differences. Not everybody's going to show the, the typical kind of age-related changes. So we, we see a lot of individual differences. We're interested in a number of questions around cognition, and we have some answers from many of these studies around the world, uh, but we expect to get some better answers here from this Canadian study. Uh, when does aging-related decline begin? Uh, we don't really know the answer. Depending on whether you look at cross-sectional studies for age differences, we see it, that it peaks in the early to mid-20s. From longitudinal studies, we see that it's rather stable, and then maybe begins to show some changes uh, in later life. We're very interested in why these changes occur, uh, and particularly uh, when, in understanding why these changes occur, how can we prevent, delay, or treat these changes? Uh, we're interested in understanding whether an individual is changing more rapidly than they have in the past, so beginning to detect those changes that might be related to uh, 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 some, some brain pathology. Uh, and what is the impact of early life characteristics and, and, and how does this play out over adolescence and young adulthood in the midlife and later life? So we really take a long-term view of changes in uh, both physical and, and mental functioning across the lifespan and see how these, these changes occur uh, across that, that long period of time. Uh, so within this Canadian longitudinal study, and in the context of other longitudinal studies, we're very interested in the role that lifespan factors have on health and cognitive functioning. We're interested in uh, from early childhood through later life. We're often focusing on long periods of the lifespan. We, we know that we need to follow up individuals, that, that every one of you uh, is, is different in terms of your experiences across the lifespan, the types of contexts, the types of work environments, uh, 
all kinds of differences. And we're trying to understand this complexity within these studies. We're also very much aware that there are birth cohort differences, that people born in different birth years, born early in the 19th century, differ from those born in the middle of the uh, 19th century. And we're interested in, 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 in what those exposures, what those different contexts, what those uh, different systems were, and how they impact people. We know from a variety of studies that there are risk factors and protective factors for your cognitive health. Uh, not surprisingly, many of the risk factors relate to particular types of diseases, chronic diseases, particularly vascular disease. So basically, what is good for your heart is good for your brain. Uh, so we see cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and so on. But also uh, mental health, depression, visual and hearing deficits, smoking, these all seem to have some detrimental effects on cognitive health. In terms of decreasing risk, Individuals with higher physical activity, greater cognitive engagement, more social interaction, less social isolation. Mediterranean diet, uh, uh, educational attainment, socioeconomic status, and so on. So there's a variety of things that are modifiable across a lifespan and even presently that, that one can do to improve one's cognitive health. Now, I understand that these tests are not often fun to do. Um, I want you to know that nobody really enjoys them that I've met. Uh, they're often very challenging. They're meant to be very challenging. They're meant not to have perfect scores. So that, you know, we don't want people to get a, a perfect score on these tests, so we make them deliberately very, very hard so that so don't expect you're going to do, do well on these, or, you know, or you're going to perceive you're going to do well, because they're, it, that's how they're designed. So I just wanted to, to talk about a few of these tests. I think you've all experienced these. And just to let you know a little bit about what they're meant to measure uh, and why that's important. So the Ray Auditory Verbal Learning Test, this is where you're, you're given a, a, a list of words, and you're asked to recall these words, and then after a few minutes, recall them again, this delayed recall. So this is, this is measuring your memory retention, your ability to learn a list of words that, that really have no meaning for you, but this is what you're asked to do. Um, we found in preliminary results that women recall slightly more words in their age group than men. Animal naming is a, a measure of verbal fluency, and uh, it's a test often used in neuropsychology to dissociate normal cognitive changes from early stage dementia. And so this is, uh, this is where you're asked to produce as many animal names as you can within a minute. Uh, men and women show similar results, uh, and there were some, some language differences in terms of this particular test. The mental alteration test um, is a measure both of your cognitive processing speed, how quickly you can perform a task, and your mental flexibility. So, this is a particular test where you're asked to alternate between the alphabet and numbers, so A1, B2, C3, and so on, as quickly as you can. And as I mentioned, this is one of those kinds of tests where younger people tend to do better. It's that speed of processing that, that is, is just really at, at its peak early in life. Uh, the Stroop test is a very similar type of test. It has this, this kind of switching uh, aspect to it. So it measures attention, mental speed, mental control by asking you to identify the name of a color and the color of a word on a page. So there's some interference sometime about that. And that's, that's always quite challenging. Uh, and again, here, younger participants are able often to complete the test with uh, as, uh, more quickly than older individuals. And this is, this is found across many types of studies. Uh, the FAS is, is similar to animals. Here you're asked to produce as many words as possible in 60 seconds that begin with F or A or S. And I just wanted to, and we can talk more about this. I look forward to your questions. Uh, I just wanted to, to reinforce that uh, this study, as are many of these studies, it's really all about better understanding of what, what determines healthy aging. What are the individual differences that, that lead to some individuals be able to uh, perform better, function better physically, mentally, across their lifespan. 
Uh, and it's really meant to bend this curve, to increase this idea of, of health span, to increase the number of healthy years of life. And that's, that's really a major, major aim of this, this kind of study um, that, that has both individual and, and policy implications. So I'll stop with that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm the sole non-researcher here. Um, my participation in the, the uh, longitudinal study of aging was really, um, I have probably seen many of you as I've driven up and down the island to do physical exams and see people personally. Um, the the, um, the um, purpose from, from a geriatrician perspective, from a clinician perspective, is really to, for us to try and um, find out what happens to people as they age, as they are diverse, as uh, people have said before. Um, what is it that makes people frail? Because that's really what we're most interested in. Geriatricians um, look at people from a holistic pattern, but we um, are not organ specific, right? So um, we can look at your heart as well as your nervous system, as well as your um, um, stomach at the same time. And we will actually answer more than one question at a time. Um, so we look at the physical and the cognitive as well as the emotional state and in particular look at some of those social um, factors that really are important for people to age well. And as we, there's been in the news a lot of um, studies now coming out about how loneliness, loneliness affects age and frailty. And frailty has really been something that we've been um, concerned about for the last 30 years. It's really what happens to somebody with a constellation of comorbidities, so different diseases, and they build up and make people more vulnerable to um, adverse outcome. So disability and, and death, really. And so it's a clinical syndrome uh, where people complain of feeling weak and feeling tired and then not able to do things and they may not eat well. These are our tea and toasters who don't really want to eat, don't want to bother making a meal. These are, these are my people. These are the people that I see. I mostly wouldn't see any of you because my patients can't come out to a function like this. These are people who have sarcopenia, which is um, uh, loss of muscle, so that they have difficulty getting in and out of chairs. Um, they have problems with their balance and with their walking and they're prone to falls. They become quite deconditioned so they can't do as much as they used to do. So where they used to be able to go out and shop, now they maybe can't leave the house. Uh, and they have osteopenia, which just means um, their bone mass is not normal. So it's a little weaker, but not necessarily osteoporotic. And what happens is that if somebody has a lot of those of um, features, then tiny little uh, insults physiologically can tip them over. So somebody who's really robust can have a bladder infection or a pneumonia or something and recover quite well. But if you already have no functional reserve, um, that can, can drop you down to a state where you really don't recover. And what this shows here is that the, the younger person, the fit person, will have a dip in their function and recover quite quickly and get back to normal. So those are the people that geriatricians never see. What we see are the people who are frail, who are more marginal, needing, they're just kind of hanging in on by their fingernails at home, and then something happens to them. And they become very much more debilitated, less able to manage, needing help, requiring assistance with things. And they have a much longer recovery. They don't recover the same way as a, a robust person. And they may not ever actually get back to their pre-morbid, their pre-disease state. So for us, the reason why frailty is important is because these people are complicated. That's why I went into geriatrics, because they're complicated and they're interesting, but it also makes treatment much more complicated because the treatment for one disease has impact on the treatment for another. Um, they have much more complex care planning so that um, 
you, if they are in hospital and have had surgery, you can't just send them out on day three. Uh, they need to usually to have a bit more time and supports put in place. And there's much greater costs for care then. And in this day and age, then costs for that individual to have care because the public system only pr provides so much. <clears throat> it's a very dynamic process. And some of it is, is reversible. And we need to try and sort out what we can uh, fix, what we can make better in people. Um, certainly, frail people are more likely to die from, from disease than people who are robust. And with chronic diseases, all of these, um, uh, if you have more diseases and frailty, then you're more likely to succumb to your disease, right? So we really want to try and people who are at risk for frailty. So the, before you become frail, try and sort out um, what we can do differently, what we can do preventively to try and help people. So, and, and that way we can target our resources both in the hospital and in the community, so that we, these people can go into fall prevention programs, they can be um, you know, in programs where they do weight training, where they have social groups and interaction with people, meal programs. And because frailty is really um, uh, something that we have to use as, a, as a, um, a way to try and make healthcare decisions as well. So people who are extremely frail than ha uh, and more likely to have a drop in their health and well-being with surgery or with treatment for different diseases. You have to take that frailty into account. So whether or not the benefits of surgery or chemotherapy are really worth it, and whether it's going to make it um, make them their their life um, less than what they'd want, right? And then, we, you know, the palliative and therapeutic harmonization um, is just what we do as we try and look at frailty and all the complex diseases and put it into context for them so they can help with making their decisions about what treatments they want. So whether or not um, those kinds of things are, are truly beneficial to, the, to them. Because just because a physician says that they should have open heart surgery doesn't mean that you want to have open heart surgery, right? So in, in the, um, the study, we do look at cardiovascular wellness, look at exercise tolerance. How far can you walk? What can you do? How active are you? Because that is important for um, uh, your overall sense of well-being. If you've had any heart disease, other uh, vascular risk factors, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol. You, you do an EKG, which is pretty easy. Uh, cardiovascular health, we're really trying to prevent, looking at your stroke risk. Again, it's high blood pressure, heart disease, um, diabetes, heart rhythm problems, all of those things that make predispose one to having stroke. Because although we have made huge advances with uh, stroke management, Still, it can be a devastating, uh, a catastrophic change in your health. Falls and fractures. Um, this is um, uh, what is something that um, we know to be a problem for, for individuals that really impacts on their life going forward. There are lots of different e diseases that cause falls whether you have Meniere's disease, an inner ear uh, problem, you have Parkinson's disease, you've had previous strokes, uh, if you have osteoarthritis and get a lot of pain, all of those things can predispose you to falls. Uh, and we have, we have fall prevention programs to try and um, help with those. What is um, devastating is when you also have low bone uh, density. So your maximum bone density happens when you're 25 or 30. And then it's, it goes down. Every year, every year, it just goes down slowly. It goes down, accelerates down with women with menopause. And so women tend to have more problems with osteoporosis than men. 
until um, later in life, and men then catch up. What we used to do was um, give you your T-score on the bone densitometry, and that will give you your, a risk of what, um, uh, what your likelihood was to have a fracture with a fall. Um, and now we do a FRAC score, which is uh, something that gives you a 10-year probability. Um, so with the bone, bone densitometry, which some of you have had, really looks at the, what the bone mineral density is at the hip. It doesn't really talk about, uh, unless you have a, a whole body scan, it won't tell you about your vertebral um, column. It won't give you that score. It won't tell you what your risk of fracture is of your wrist as you're falling and you put out your hand. But the radiation exposure from, from that, which is what people are most concerned about, is about what your background radiation is every day. Get more radiation flying to Hawaii and back than you'd get from a bone densitometry. And the FRAC score you can do with or without the densitometry now. The FRAC score looks at all the risk factors that we know that uh, predispose you to having um, a fracture of your bone uh, with minimal trauma, okay? So just falling from a standing height. So the older you are, more likely, because you're gonna have lower bone density. If you've had previous fractures, obviously you already have osteoporosis, and so you're predisposed to it. If you have a disease where you fall a lot, you're more likely because you're going to have more um, opportunity to, to break. Um, if you've been on steroids, you've been on prednisone for anything, for asthma, for uh, if you've had it for gout or uh, arthritis to settle down the flares, if you've had some kind of immune disease, then you're more likely to have problems because it leaches the calcium out of your bones. If you have a family history of hip fractures, so if your parents had hip fractures, you're more likely to have hip fractures. If you smoke, or if you um, had too much alcohol, like excess alcohol in your past, um, you're more likely to have a fracture, again, because it leaches the calcium out of your bones. And then for certain diseases, um, rheumatoid arthritis, liver disease, um, malabsorption, all of those kinds of things will interfere with how you absorb calcium, uh, absorb vitamin D, or um, it interferes with your mobility so your bones just don't stay as strong. And fractures, for us, as a ger for me as a geriatrician, for us as, as, as a health community, are, are important because it causes chronic pain, um, cause deformity. So you've seen the people with multiple vertebral compression fractures who are just hunched over because they collapse the front of their vertebrae and then they don't have good um, lung expansion either, so it's a cascade of problems that happen. Uh, they get depressed because they can't do things because they're always in pain. Um, the less they do, the less they're able to do, and they die. And so 50% of people who have a hip fracture uh, require a walking aid or they don't walk again. And 25% of them will require residential care and won't, won't go home after hospitalization. And at five years, um, there's a significant increase in mortality on people who've had hip fracture than those who haven't. So for, for us, we need to do, f figure out whatever we can to try and prevent that from happening. So um, from, a, from a geriatrician pers perspective, this longitudinal study uh, f um, is helping, I hope, uh, change what happens going forward so that the patients in uh, another 10 years time or 20 years time, we will have a better understanding of what we can do to prevent the problems before they begin. Thank you, Dr. Bader.
I'm savoring this evening because in 2011, with the help of Center on Aging staff, now the Institute on Aging, my colleague Lynn Young and I helped open the data collection site in August 2012. And I've now stepped down and am so grateful to Scott that he's taking this on. It's such an important study and it's the kind of work that we're doing off the side of our desk. We don't get reassigned time from teaching. It's, it's a labor of love and it's a labor of love for you to participate and I'm so grateful to see so many of you. It's so rare that we get to gather and, and you get to hear a little bit about why the study matters and um, why we hope you'll continue participating for the next 14 years. So some of you are now 91 years old, if you were 85 when it started. <laughs> so we're getting to a really interesting part. And this next year, we'll have two data points. And so the, some of what I'm presenting tonight is really just descriptive data, um, simple analyses. But we're going to be able to start doing some much more interesting work um, moving forward. So. Okay, I'm gonna to talk tonight a little bit about caregiving and care receiving. How many of you have been caregivers? Just raise your hand. Yes, look around the room. Almost half of you, I think. So about eight million Canadians have been caregivers um, for family members or friends. Caregiving, unfortunately, can have quite negative effects on health and also on finances. Um, in particular, on health caregivers and care recipients can become isolated as chronic conditions progress. And um, I don't know how many of you know, the, in the UK, they've appointed a minister of loneliness now because the impact of loneliness and social isolation is as great as smoking 15 cigarettes or being overweight. So I think as we move forward, it's going to be interesting to look at some of the social data and uh, the impact um, that caregiving has on social connections amongst people. Unfortunately, home care is not covered under the Canada Health Act, even if it's considered medically necessary. So home care varies across provinces. Um, and unfortunately, about almost a half um, million Canadians have unmet needs for, for home care. The CLSA is the first longitudinal study to collect data on caregiving and care receiving. And so we now have an opportunity to examine patterns. And that's the power of a longitudinal study. We can see variation within in individuals. And you can't do that when you just have data at one point. And it becomes more powerful as we move forward. So over the next three years, we'll have three data points. And that will allow us to, to really see change over time. Um, so particularly with caregiving, the patterns we're interested in is who provides care, what types of care are they providing. We know, for example, that um, if you're caring for someone with memory loss, it's much more stressful. It has much more of an impact on caregivers than someone who needs more personal care, physical care. Um, we're interested in the impact of caregiving on relationships, on work, on health. Um, also, the use of assistive technologies and environmental accommodations and how that can mitigate um, dis disabling um, conditions and allow people to function more independently. Um, so some of the measures for caregiving that we're looking at are the type of care people get, the number of people who are providing care, because there's often one primary caregiver, but there can also be other family members who provide a bit of support. We like to know whether or not um, the caregiver is living with the care recipient, and what's the sex of the care recipient? Um, what's the relationship they have? Are you an adult daughter caring for a parent? Are you a spouse caring for, for your um, husband or wife? It's also important to look at, in regards to caregiving, the intensity of care required. How long have you been caregiving? How many weeks? How many hours? each week are you providing care. So all of these things give us a, a sense of the intensity, the duration, um, the impact of caregiving. Now when we look at care receiving, many of the questions are similar, and you've probably noticed that. Um, but we also ask about the type of care being received and the intensity of care, so those overlap. But then we also ask about whether or not people are receiving professional or paid um, assistance. Are you paying for home Care? Are you receiving home care? Who paid for the care? Um, is it coming out of your pocket or is it something that happens to be covered um, by the, the provincial, uh, by the health authority? Um, we ask about the activity that required the most assistance. You know, is it bathing or is it shopping? Or it gives us a sense of um, just the, 
the, the difficulty someone may be having. Um, we ask about the person who provided the most time and resources and their relationship and living arrangements. So it's very comprehensive and it really is gonna give us a unique look at caregiving as well as care receiving. So what are some of the findings um, that we're learning about? Well, in terms of age, caregiving is highest among participants who are 55 to 64 years of age. Almost 50% of caregivers fall into that category. Care receivers were highest among those aged 75 years and older. So about one in five care receivers are age 75 and older. Not too surprising, but this gives us um, information that can allow us to do some planning. In terms of sex, women were more likely to be both caregivers, over 50, about 54%, and they were also more likely to be care receivers, about 58%. Um, caregivers were usually married, um, and compared to care receivers. Um, and education, caregivers were more likely to have graduated from high school. Um, living arrangements. Typically, caregivers are living with their spouse, so we have a lot of spousal caregivers. Um, care receivers were more likely to live alone. Um, that's often because the care receiver um, is widowed um, and may just be struggling. Employment. Um, many caregivers were retired, about 42%, but about 61% of care receivers were retired, so more care receivers were retired. But still 60%, it's, um, it tells us that 40% of people who need care are still doing some sort of work, which is interesting. Um, findings in terms of health. Caregivers, 65% were more likely to report excellent or very good health compared to care receivers. The care receivers, um, only one in three reported um, excellent or very good health. This is a statistic that kind of points out the difference between um, how you self-report your health versus having a disability. You can be in good health and still have difficulty doing certain tasks, right? Um, whoops, I passed that. Let me go back to that for a minute. Oops. Okay. Well, let me just tell you, I accidentally pushed it. Um, chronic conditions. So about 16% of caregivers report depression. And among care recipients, that's about one in four people who report depression. Diabetes. 15% of caregivers had diabetes. 27% of care receivers. So almost double the number of care receivers had diabetes, which is a significant cause of renal failure, of um, limb loss, um, and of a lot of other health conditions. Um, among caregivers, 14% reported having cancer. And heart disease, care receivers had twice the rates of heart disease, about almost 20%. So one in five care receivers had heart disease. But caregivers also, 9% had heart disease. So I, I think I learned this when I was working critical care a number of years back. Like I was discharging patients who were almost like in their 90s to their 70-year-old adult children. And we were expecting them to be in good enough health to be the caregiver. And that just wasn't the case always. And it didn't make sense. And it points to the real need for home care and support. Um, we're living longer, and our adult children are sometimes in their 70s, 60s, 50s, and we need to have social systems that, that support um, people aging in place with, with some supports. Okay, um, quality of life. So social activities. About half of all caregivers report that they're able to get out once a week, um, as do care receivers. But some caregivers, 7% um, of caregivers and 14% of care receivers report only getting out about once a year. So this harkens back to the loneliness issue, right? And um, other studies have shown that about one in four older adults um, don't have anyone that they can confide in, anyone that they feel close to. And um, so that's reflected in, in some of these social activities and the lack thereof. Life satisfaction. Um, we ask about life satisfaction and about one in 10 um, caregivers and 20% of care receivers um, report poor life satisfaction. So just to wrap up, um, what are the next steps? Um, 
We're looking forward to doing some analyses of the care being given and received and the intensity and duration of that. We don't have that yet. And the relationship between the caregiver and, and care receiver. We need to have some multivariate model to understand the factors, the, um, the many factors that affect caregiving and care receiving. And there's a whole group that I'm particularly interested in, those who are aging with lifelong disabilities like polio, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, or traumatic brain injury. Um, this, often we haven't had studies that allow us to look at some of these subgroups that are particularly affected because over the course of a lifetime, it seems like they age a bit faster in terms of if you've had, for example, like, um, a traumatic brain injury, you're at greater risk for having cognitive impairment in later life. So this study, the CLSA, is going to allow us to look at some of those relationships as well. And um, someone who's had polio, which is now an artifact, you probably all remember polio from the 1950s, but we thought that when people recovered from polio that they were pretty stable. And there were people who were passers, you would call. You'd never know that they had polio. Well, they started having secondary health conditions associated with that polio that were related to kind of the hidden effects of the neurological trauma that had occurred. And so, in a sense, they were aging more quickly. They were having more disabilities, more problems aging in place. And so being aware of those kinds of things has implications for other neurological conditions as well, potentially. Um, so these longitudinal, and we want, we're looking forward to doing longitudinal analyses because what I've just reported is really just from one point in time. By early this next year, we should have some data on the two points in time, and we'll have some very interesting things to, to report to you. Thank you. So I have type 1 diabetes, and I noticed that diabetes was pointed up there as, as a an aging factor. So does it matter to your aging study whether it's type 1 or type 2? Dr. Bader? It doesn't, it doesn't matter to us. It, um, type 1, um, type 1, type 2, it doesn't matter. It's the same difference that what happens at a micro, uh, microscopic level and at a microvascular level. So um, we see that uh, the vascular changes and neurologic changes probably 10 years before a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. So it, um, we see complications from type 2 happening earlier than what we do for type 1 for after diagnosis. So it makes no difference to us. Uh -oh. Thank you. This question is for Dr. Cloutier. I was wondering if you could explain why the environment is just 10 to 20% of health determinants. It seems to me that air quality, water quality, I would add soil quality and peace are fundamental to health and life. So can you explain that, please? Thank you. <laughs> that is a wonderful question. <laughs> and it's not really very easy to explain, but one of the simplest explanations, I believe, is that uh, we have not tended to study air quality, water quality, soils in relation to health in sufficient measure. So that partly it's an underestimate in terms of the actual environmental attributes and how they influence our health. In part, it's being studied more under epigenetics. And again, as we talked about, thinking about the complex nature of some of these relationships and their interactions. So within the CLSA, we can start to look at the data in that kind of a fashion. But I, I don't think historically we have done an adequate job. And part of the reason has been that uh, ministries of health don't necessarily work with the Ministry of the Environment and the Ministry of Natural Resources and share those data that would provide a clearer, more definitive picture about what some of the trends and relationships are. Thank you for your question. Oh. Yeah, um, I 
I was just thinking about that question myself, and I was wondering if it is because all of the data is gathered within Canada because we don't have that great a diversity. If we were looking at international data and you were including places like Palestine and so, you know, I think it would have a much bigger impact. Yeah, really a, a good point. And I think with the advent of, of uh, geographic information systems, we're now starting to gather more information in terms of air quality and water quality through monitoring stations and being able to look at some of the spatial patterns, which we didn't see before because we didn't engage in those types of studies. So I think we'll see more of this research on a continuous basis than we have in the past. Yeah. Sir, nice and close to your mouth. Hi. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just behind you anyway. <laughs> um, in, in the risk for fall, if there was nothing mentioned about balance or loss of equilibrium or anything like that, and is that important or is it not a factor or? Oh, absolutely it's important. So. Part of, uh, in, in the questionnaires that, that uh, you do, there are some, um, some diseases that, are, uh, that we know are related to falling that, that people are asked about. But um, balance is um, complex. And so uh, lots of times it's a combination of a few things together that causes a, a loss of balance. So it's hard to, uh, without extending your survey another 35 questions, um, it's hard to kind of tease that out. So we, I think this, the study was looking at, at a, broad, a broad pattern of, of falls. I absolutely, um, there's some reasonable evidence that things like Tai Chi and stuff like that really help with balance, even in people who have um, impaired balance. And um, so that's the kind of stuff that, w that we're trying to do um, it, from a therapeutic perspective. But, but is loss of balance a symptom of aging? Um, I, I don't think it's a symptom of aging. I think it's a, well, loss of balance is a result of a whole bunch of comorbidities. So loss of muscle strength and um, slowing of reflexes. So in that respect, um, if your balance is off, you are more likely to fall because you can't correct yourself uh, the center of gravity change. The, the center of gravity in your body is a little different with age, again because of a change in the ratio of fat to lean um, muscle mass, and so those things are all just incrementally push you more likely to having falls. But you know, we all fall. Um, I actually, when I was at Botanical Beach on, on Saturday, I had a close encounter with the Salal to try and prevent me from <laughs> having my head go against a rock. Um, but uh, so uh, there are lots of different things that cause balance. It's just that it's more likely to be um, problematic the older you are and the frailer you are. Yeah. Try it again. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just before we do another question from the audience, I'll do one of the written ones. This one's for Scott, I think. What other nations are doing similar work on aging, and are there any multinational studies that you know of? There are, well, it, there are aging studies all over the world. Um, I direct a, a network funded by the National Institute on Aging in, in the U.S. 
that has over 120 studies that are part of our, our network. And what we do is we bring these various studies and research teams together to analyze so we can, we can better compare results across these studies. Uh, there are a few studies like the uh, Health and Retirement Study, the English Longitudinal Study, and a, a whole variety of studies that are based on those models that permit you to more directly compare uh, aging, health, economic status, all kinds of questions across these countries. Uh, the HRS model of studies is, is, is an excellent model. It's all telephone survey. It doesn't go, it's beginning to go into some of the de detail, but not near the detail that this Canadian longitudinal study provides. So we're, we're going to get a lot more in-depth information about, uh, uh, about aging and, and the determinants of aging from this study, I think, than, than, than other studies that are, that are uh, maybe a little broader in that way. Okay, and this question is for Deborah. Well, caregiving seemed to, ref your, I think your presentation seemed to refer to, caregiving, uh, to caring for elderly care receivers. Is there a correlation when caring for, young, uh, for younger people, in, for example, grandchildren? So when we're talking about mm. caregivers, yeah. care receivers. Yeah, very good question. Um, there are a lot of grandparents who are caring for grandchildren because of adult children who have um, um, drug problems or alcohol problems. Um, that really can impose a bit of a financial burden on caregivers. Um, yeah, so it's complex. And then there are the, the um, parents who have children, adult children with developmental disabilities. Um, those children are now outliving those adult children with um, um, Down syndrome and, and other um, um, conditions are outliving their parents. And, um, and that can really take a toll on, on caregivers too because, um, because they're growing older and they're providing a lot of support to their adult children with perhaps mental disabilities. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I'm gonna answer this one. The hearing test at the Gorge Road Hospital is not valid. The room is not soundproof and I can always hear noises in the hall, the next room to where the interviews are. Will a new venue be found soon? Uh, we're not looking for a new venue, but we did soundproof the room, or we tried to soundproof the room. In fact, we've done such a good job at putting soundproof, uh, we've put some uh, weather stripping, weatherproofing stuff around the door, and it works so well now the staff can't hear when the hearing test ends. <laughs> okay, so is there a question, another question in the audience? Okay, Ashley Dronfield. It strikes me that you should be studying personality because I think varying personalities have... Oh, yeah. it strikes me that you should be um, studying personality because different personalities react differently and it's a huge factor, I think. Hmm. Uh, I don't think that the, this study is doing it, but we have looked certainly at resiliency in caregivers. Um, right. and, and in the study that we did when it was called the Center of Aging um, <laughs> with uh, Holly Tuco, um, caregivers for um, seniors were providing uh, around 69 hours of caregiving hours every week, which is huge. And um, it really was what we found, the ones who struggled versus the ones who didn't. It really was about resiliency and their ability to um, seek help and kind of roll with the punches to a certain extent. And I also, um, we also found that um, if you're caregiving for someone who seems depressed or apathetic or inactive and not doing stuff is much harder in many ways, uh, much harder for the caregiver to deal with than someone who isn't. I wasn't thinking so much of the caretakers. I was thinking of people who are getting older and sort of fighting their body. And uh, I, I just thinking of longitudinal studies of aging that it, depending on one's personality you could last longer if you were stubborn enough you know <laughs> uh, scott did you want to uh, address it did you want to say something and the impact of optimism versus someone who's yeah so 
<laughs> so while personality isn't currently part of the CLSA, it, it may be in the future. It is part of many other longitudinal studies. Yeah. And uh, as part of this multi-study framework, we, we have a, a terrific team at Northwestern University that is looking at personality. They just, we just had a workshop on what's called healthy neuroticism <laughs> to, <laughs> to test this idea that, you know, if you're really concerned about your, your physical and mental health and, you know, you're, you're, you're high on neuroticism, does that at some point become good for you? Uh, unfortunately, the answer was no. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, Ashley, yes. I, I have another question, if I may. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we'll, we'll come back to you if okay. we have time, okay? I was wondering why there were so few questions about physical doing exercising. Uh, I don't think I've been asked like you told you that I walk, I, I go on a half hour walk every day, I do aquafit, I go hiking and so forth, and there haven't been any questions in this area. Joanne, can you speak to the, the questions in the CLSA? I actually will ask one of the in-home interviewers, Ashley, you could some of the questions that you ask at the in-home interview. There's a number of questions actually around exercise, <laughs> participation in uh, sports and recreation. Did you want to try a shot at it? You're more familiar with the tools. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. Sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Oh, I was asking, Ashley Clark, who's sitting beside you, is one of our in-home interviewers. And I know in the in-home interview, there are a number of questions that we ask about uh, mild, moderate, and intense um, exercising. We ask about <laughs> walking and things like pickleball and swimming and golf and the whole works, but there's also other questions. Do you want to speak to it? Um, so the physical activity questionnaire looks at over the past seven days, and they ask um, how often you engage in sitting activities, walking, light sports, moderate sports, uh, strenuous activities, and then um, things like weightlifting. Um, so you should have been asked about just the past seven days of your physical activity, and then you have a chance to say if that's typical for you in the past year, or if it's not typical. This is also a perfect time. If you have questions, and McMaster may not appreciate my saying this, but if you have questions about the kinds of questions you're asked, or you want to review the kinds of questions that you're asked, on the CLSA site, which is clsa-elcv.ca, the website, there is a section for researchers, which is publicly available to everybody, which does have the interview tools. So you can review in that section, uh, or in that section of the website, the types of t um, questions that are asked in each of the various sections. Thank you. And I just wanted to say, that's a, it's a great question. Physical activity is, mm -hmm. is really one of the most important modifiable lifestyle factors we have. It, it affects both physical and mental health uh, in, in so many ways. It, it's just yeah. such an important factor. Yeah, what we recommend is five days a week 30 minutes of moderate exercise, which is exercise enough to make you a bit breathless, so you can still talk, but you can't sing. <laughs> okay, Ashley? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, countries like Finland and Denmark are some of the most happiest uh, countries in the world. Um, we have, over there, they have basic level of income from, from birth to death. And I see those countries where they ensure what your categories are for social, economic, education, all of those key factors to a good life from, again, birth to death. This study, are you guys able to leverage our own government to help them? You know, because you guys talked about having lack of, of funding for basic essential needs as, as we age. Mm -hmm. And yet we have countries that have seemed to have figured it out quite easily. That's a, I, I would just say quickly, that's a, it's a great question. We just had a, a terrific phone call with the Office of the Seniors Advocate here in BC. Uh, the, this office contacted the CLSA and then put them in touch with us. Um, we will be working closely together as well as with other seniors advocates across Canada 
So we, we expect that the CLSA and the data that you're all providing is going to have an impact broadly across Canada and for policy and to inform government. So that's, it was a very exciting phone call. We're very enthusiastic about this collaboration and uh, it's going to be an important step. Yeah, I, I was just going to add that the Scandinavian countries, uh, as many of you will know, are heavily taxed for all of the social programs that are provided there. And in a Canadian context, we have not necessarily been interested in that kind of a level of taxation to support some of the programs that we need. As uh, Deborah mentioned, more investment in home care, more investment in family-friendly policies so that our, our workplaces too may, may let us uh, engage in caregiving roles. And so from the 1970s, we kind of feel that Canada has been falling behind in terms of some of these more progressive social policies. We've actually been dismantling our safety net quite effectively in many ways. And yet on, by the same token, we don't want that high level of taxation that might be required. So we have to find some middle ground solutions and use this information to mobilize the knowledge that we find and change policy with your voices and with the research findings is one way that we can try to move these things forward. Okay, I'm going to also take some written questions because there, there's uh, several on the same uh, general topic. And Deborah, I'm going to put, put you on the spot for this since you were in, involved in the earlier stage. Uh, most of the questions have to do with how the participants were selected for the study. Um, there's questions like, uh, there, some seem, there seems to be very little diversity of participants, no First Nations or other than older white people. How were the participants <laughs> selected? Um, you, how were the 50,000 individuals selected? Does the study mm -hmm. represent the demographics of Canada? Is there a peer, was there a peer review process of the data? Mm -hmm. Um, were the participants in the study selected to reflect, reflect the ethnicity of the Canadian population, etc.? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the sample was selected very carefully to try to ensure balance. Now, of course, most of the, many of the participants in the CLSA that come into the data collection sites, there's 30,000 that come into the data collection sites, so you have to live within 25 kilometers of a site. So that restricts it a bit. And the effort to counter that sort of bias was to have a cohort of 20,000 people that were randomly selected also through phone, by phone calling, randomly selected across a much broader geographic area. But it's true, the people that come into the DCS are people who can make it to our data collection site. So they tend to be healthier. They tend to appreciate the value of research. Um, so we've tried to, to make it as unbiased as possible and pretty rigorous sampling. It also had to be balanced with age groups and by gender. Um, so all of that's been a bit of a challenge. But I wanted to mention, Joanne, um, I don't know if all of you know that there is a report that was put out, I think it was in April by the CLSA that has a, a number of chapters of research using the data and it was it's been released and I'm sure it's available on the CLSA website. Yep. And I encourage you to download that. It's a PDF and it's free and available to you. Mm -hmm. And you'll, you'll see my chapter on caregiving and other chapters on cognition and, and lots of different topics. Yep. It's our it's, first big publication. It's about 200 and some pages, so a little light reading for you. <laughs> there was a copy on the table out in the, uh, in the foyer, but it, Deborah's right, it is on the website. So. If you have trouble finding it, just let me know at the, at the um, DCS site and I'll give you the proper link. But you can access it through the website. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm an engineer, so I'm prefacing my comments right now. But first of all, congratulations on four very interesting presentations. I think they were well worth the time. <laughs> my question from an engineering perspective is, I've been in the side of science and research and gathering data, but data in and of itself doesn't affect change. And what I would like to get from the four of you is your vision on where you think this data gathering will take us in terms of new construction techniques to allow people to age in place or transportation or improvements in medical care. Where do you think it's going to take us? Because right now, data by itself will not affect the change. Mm -hmm. Thank and, you, you. and you'd like a comment from each of the panelists? Okay, Scott, you're on. <laughs> uh, so the sample size of the Canadian Longitudinal Study is sufficient to permit us to 
get better answers to how these various risk and protective factors complement or interact with one another. We don't know that. That really hasn't been done because most of these longitudinal studies are in the hundreds of, of individuals or perhaps a few thousands. Uh, and so the, the level of detail, the level of richness of the data that are, that are available to us, I think we're going to get better answers and new answers than we've been able to get to before. And I also mentioned uh, our, our partnership with the Seniors Advocate Office. I think this is a very important step to work with that kinds of, of ombudsman uh, that, that is an arm's length away from the government, but which produces the, 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 the level and quality of reports that really do affect the decision making. So I think that is a, a really great step for us and for CLSA. Okay, Marilyn. Well, I think the, probably the best that we can hope for is that we're going to make a difference um, with respect to some of the social determinants, the caregiving, housing, um, um, and support. What is, what is for the, you know, ongoing. Um, medicine itself, um, I, I will say that older adults are kind of like a black hole in medical data. So the, the studies are done on younger people and extrapolated to older people. And um, so as geriatricians, we, we kind of, uh, well, we don't usually follow the guidelines because the guidelines are, are um, for people who are in their 40s and 50s with a sp one specific disease as opposed to somebody in their 80s with seven different diseases. Um, so I, I, what I would hope that it would do is kind of help us to um, identify things that might be preventative, that might alter that trajectory into frailty, um, and as well support the people who are going to support folk who need it. Okay, and D D Denise? Yeah, that's such a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, I think. Uh, one of the things that I would say is we need to turn that question around to this group and it kind of builds on what Deborah said as well. We've got two data points now, we're going to get another data point. That kind of level of information starts to help us understand how things are going and what their implications are and what's important and what needs to be addressed in terms of public health policy, um, helping geriatricians and physicians provide the care that they need and all of the other care workers who are involved in supporting older adults. So uh, I think, you know, we need you to continue to build on these data and allow us to do uh, the research that we're doing with it to inform policy. We no longer have the luxury in universities of just doing research for the sake of doing research anymore. All of the research that we do is meant to be more applied, is meant to be translated and mobilized. So we have you know, a, a very strong sense of responsibility for moving these data forward into policy, into change, into meaningful change for um, helping older adults to live well and healthy and, and families who care for them and providers who care for them as well. So I thank you for that question. Yeah. And um, what I can add to that is there is a bit of a, a movement afoot that needs to grow into a real social movement. Have you heard about age-friendly communities and dementia-friendly communities? We need to work with our partners, partner organizations in the community to, to really um, try to mobilize the public voice to demand that communities are age-friendly, that, that people are able to go out and walk and have a place to sit, that we can encourage them to be more active, um, that people have access to the things that can help them lead healthy and high-quality lives. Thank you. Ashley? I would like to know how you define caregiving. I'm rather stumped when I get that question because I'm, I don't live with my father, but he's alone and I'm on the phone with him every day. I take care of all his finances, do his um, 
medical appointments, even though he lives in another city. So does that count? I mean, is that what you're looking for? It's not very clear exactly. Mm -hmm. I've always answered no, but now I'm oh, questioning no, no. it. You should be answering yes. Yes, okay. you should be answering yes. You probably think you're just being a good daughter. And that's the issue. Caregivers are, don't think of themselves as caregivers. They hesitate to use that term. Mm -hmm. But when you're providing support to another person that's enabling them to, to remain in their home, that's definitely caregiving. Whether it's personal or more instrumental kinds of help, like helping them with their checkbook and stuff like that, all of that counts as caregiving. Okay, and I'm going to add one of the written questions to that, which is, is a wife considered a caregiver or a husband? Depends what the husband needs, no, <laughs> <laughs> the wife needs. <laughs> yeah, it depends, I think, what kind of support, you know, what role you're in. You are a wife, and you can also be a caregiver. You can be a husband, and you can be a caregiver. We wear multiple roles, don't we? We're parents, we're children, we're sisters. Um, so caregiving's like that. It cuts across a number. It just adds to the roles that we take on. Okay. Any questions? Uh, I want to say thank you first for um, doing the study. Um, I had a work injury um, and I was a part of it six, so I had the full MRI everything six months before my injury and then a year and a half after and to see the difference uh, in the MRI and um, what I'm going through right now is I have 40% loss on my leg, and that's just my leg. And um, what I'm, I'm screaming for help from everyone. I've been to the hospital, all they give me is opioids and send me home. And I've been to emergency psychiatric. I talked to a doctor and the doctor said, well, I'm not a psychiatrist. <laughs> and I talked to a psychiatrist and says, well, I'm not from work, work safe. And I'm fighting work safe. This has been going on for four years with, um, they lie, uh, actually, okay, I'm not allowed to say they lied even. <laughs> um, they changed some documents and I've been lawyers, they're like, they need money up front I've been fighting this, I've been my own advocate. Um, and everywhere I go to for help is all I get is a phone number. And they're like, well, phone this number. And then I get an answering machine at the end of it. And if by chance someone does call me back, they're like, well, sorry, we don't offer that service. <laughs> I've had four social workers coming to my home telling me, well, you can bathe yourself, so sorry, you don't fit the criteria. And well, and, and then they say, well, it's clear that you need help, but you're falling through the cracks. And this has been going on for four years now. And I'm at my end. <laughs> I just, and my building just had a flood in it, so I spent four days in a hotel room, and now I'm in a new place with boxes, blocking my, and I don't even have a bath for pain management. I have a shower. So the movers came in, blocked off my shower, blocked off my kitchen sink, and I'm like, and I need help, and I'm screaming for help, and I'm falling through the cracks. I need help, and even you people, like, where do I go? Because all I'm getting are phone numbers with the answering machines at the end. And good question by you because it was a work injury. WorkSafe is pushing me to the disability and the disability is pushing me on to WorkSafe. And I got $300 more a month for WorkSafe to pay somebody to come into my home to help me and the disability took that away. Hmm. And, and WorkSafe was saying, well, you take care of her. And the disability is saying, well, to work safe, will you take care of her? Who's taking care of me? And I'm still getting phone numbers today. I got a phone number from someone saying, well, phone this number. Maybe you can get help. I phone the Salvation Army. They're like, sorry, we don't provide that service. Who provides service for people that need help? Really? Dr. Like, Dr. Brader, is that something that you feel you could address? And not necessarily from a geriatrician end, but just from a senior services end? So, um, 
I, I appreciate your frustration because with the public home care system, you have to require personal care um, in order for them to go in any longer due to budget stuff. Um, so, um, I'm unfortunately going away tomorrow out of province. However, um, let, me, um, let me take your information afterwards and I will have somebody call you. We'll call you, okay? Because I, I, I really don't know exactly what we can do from, through the public system. Okay, I'm all, another question for Dr. Bader, it may be a little easier, but again, several uh, questions on it. Um, the use of DNA, why don't you take DNA data into account? Are you, are, is, are you considering using DNA to augment study data at risk for dementia? Are you interested in DNA results, etc.? cetera? So, um, there are studies looking at biomarkers um, to try and predict if people are going to be, develop dementia. Um, however, um, most dementia does not appear to be, the, the, the genetic component does not appear to be that important. Uh, there are some autosomal dominant um, ones where people dement very early in their 30s and 40s. Um, where we have good genetics. The um, apolipoprotein E uh, studies just gives you a more likely or less likely. There's no guarantee. There are some other biomarkers that people are, are um, attempting to use, but it's really in the research category. The, the other thing that I would say about genetic markers is that that has huge implications for uh, life insurance and things like that. Um, it, knowing, particularly when um, at this point we don't really have any good treatment. So I'm not sure that um, it has any clinical relevance. I think in, the, in a specific study, um, well-crafted, looking at lots of cognitive uh, tests as well as imaging and biomarkers that might be useful going forward. But I think um, right now in dementia literature, we've had 15 years of negative studies uh, with respect mm -hmm. to treatment. So we don't have anything new. Um, so uh, that's why we don't do DNA testing. At this point, but I would just add to that that the biological samples are, are a very important part of this study. Uh, they are being held at McMaster University in a biorepository, a number of, of, uh, of freezers. Uh, there are plans under discussion of how this material will be used, but it is very valuable material, and I think uh, you know it's it needs to be very carefully developed and, 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 and I, I think we're also waiting for the longitudinal data to accrue. Yeah. That'll make it much more valuable as well. Okay, and Scott, well, you're still on a roll there. What can, I, what can we expect in the way of individual interviews, phone calls, questionnaires in the next 14 years? <laughs> <laughs> so put him on the spot as a site PI, right? <laughs> so well, um, can you give us some thoughts about what's coming down? Or what I think, might be coming I think more of the same to, to some extent, but I hope more differences as well. Um, the CLSA is not only a, a longitudinal study, and typically when you start a longitudinal study, you do the same thing over and over and over again. You want to maintain that continuity so you can really study change. Change within person, change on the exact same variables. Um, but it's also a research platform. It's, it's, a, it's a platform that allows uh, new questions, new measures, new, new, uh, new, new biological uh, assays and things to be, to be done. 
so it, we hope that it does also change and adapt and, and, and be a cutting edge aspect of our, our gerontological science as well. So uh, I think you can expect there to be differences year to year as well as the, the core set of measurements. Okay, and just as we finish off, is there anything else that any of the panelists would like to address uh, given the range of questions that we've had? Say that um, you know the baby boomers have done a lot for this world. So they changed education, and they changed how we shop, and they changed how we work, and now they're going to change how we age. And they are a very powerful group. You are a very powerful group, and it will be. I think um, you will get the ear of government, and there will be change. Mm -hmm. Eternally optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Denise or Deborah, did you want to add anything? I just say ditto to what Dr. Bader said. I think that's really important. Yep. We're already seeing um, new models of housing, co-housing. Um, so all of those things are going to continue to change as this cohort moves through, and um, it's one of the healthiest uh, uh, subgroups that's that's come through. So I think we're looking at a pretty good old age. Thank you. Okay, and I'd just like again to thank you for coming out tonight. This has been a good session. Uh, reminder uh, to check the CLSA website, and I'll give you the website address again, www.clsa-elcv.ca. Check that website. It's got the report that Deborah mentioned it's got webinars that come out, new research findings, etc. So as the study progresses, continue to check and monitor that website for all the new information. Even if it's a webinar uh, that's happened across the country, everything that CLSA does is available just as this uh, event has been. So thank you very much for coming out tonight. We look forward to seeing you again in the future. And a big thanks to Joanne for tonight's event. Mm -hmm.